Good afternoon, everybody. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Christian Davies. I'm the Gene Jones Director of Public Programs here at the Nevada Museum of Art. We are very excited to have everybody join us this afternoon or evening, uh, depending on where you're at, uh, for the opening public program for the Victorian Radicals from the Pre-Raphaelites to the Arts and Crafts Movement uh, exhibition. Tonight, um, we've got a, a really great program for you. I'd like to go ahead and start by saying um, a, a very heartfelt thank you to all of our generous sponsors um, who helped make this exhibition possible and this series of programs possible as well. I know many of you are in attendance. We, we thank you. Um, at this time, I'm going to go ahead and bring on Ann Wolf, who's going to introduce this evening's speaker, and we'll get going from there. Thanks very much, Christian, and uh, welcome to all of you who are joining us. Um, as you all know, we were incredibly proud and excited to open the Victorian Radicals exhibition this weekend. Uh, had a great response from our community, and I just speak on behalf of the entire staff when I say that um, we're just very proud to be able to bring this exhibition to uh, Northern Nevada at, uh, after what has been a very, very long year for so many of us. So it's a, a thrill to have these amazing artworks uh, in the museum right now. So um, it's my honor tonight to introduce uh, Dr. Berenger, who sent me a very short, like two or three sentence introduction, which was incredibly modest. I've added a couple things uh, to that, but um, I'd just like to start by saying that the exhibition is uh, actually curated by three individuals, uh, Tim Berenger, uh, as well as independent curator, Martin Ellis and Victoria Osborne at the Birmingham Museum Trust. And of course we thank all of them for putting this exhibition together. Uh, Tim Berenger specializes in the 18th, 19th and 20th century art of Britain and the British Empire, 19th century American and German art and museum studies. Following positions at the Victoria and Albert Museum and the universities of London and Birmingham in Great Britain, he started teaching at Yale University in 1998, where he is currently the professor and chair of the Department of the History of Art. So Tim's books include Reading the Pre-Raphaelites and Men at Work, Art and Labor in Victorian Britain, as well as essay collections on Victorian Jamaica and the history of panorama painting. He also greatly enjoys curatorial work. You can tell that when you see the exhibition on view at the museum. His, uh, some of, just a couple of his past exhibitions include uh, American Sublime, the book for that show has been on my shelf, uh, a favorite of mine since 2002. Um, also, The Pre-Raphaelites, Victorian Avant-Garde, which was on view at Tate Britain and the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC, uh, as well as Thomas Cole's Journey, uh, Atlantic Crossings, on view at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and uh, the National Gallery in London. Tim, we really look forward uh, to hearing you speak tonight about this great exhibition, Victorian Radicals. So thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you, Anne, and thank you, Christian, for the kind invitation to come. Of course, there's nothing I uh, would like to be more than to actually be there with you all. Um, uh, one of the things I, when the, I first saw that the museum was interested in the show was like, great, I get to go to Nevada again, one of my favorite places. So unfortunately, that will have to be deferred for a little bit, but um, I'm thrilled that the show is there. And I was even more thrilled and, and actually really moved to hear that 600 people were in there safely enjoying the show uh, just this weekend and you've had visitors back in looking at the art. We had the show here in uh, New Haven, Connecticut, which is where I'm speaking to you from today at, at Yale um, for just four weeks. And then it had to close because COVID came uh, and you know who, we, we didn't know what would happen. And so it's just a thrill to see life coming back to slightly towards normal and to see uh, you all able to enjoy this show. So let me start by sharing my screen and we'll look at some of this work together. So. That's great. There we go. So I just want to say a little bit about this uh, exhibition. The, the title of my talk, Dystopia to Utopia. Um, I hope that will become clear why I use that title as we move through. But Victorian and radicals are probably two words that you don't usually use in the same sentence. You know, Victorian conjures up bed and breakfast with frilly doilies and or your grandmother's closet or your great grandmother's closet if you're my students or um you know um something uh, unchallenging threatening homely and then radicals is you know bold and and dramatic and wanting to change the world and we wanted to show that these things are connected and i do want to acknowledge my colleagues uh, victoria osborne and martin ellis and victoria is uh, still the curator at the 
exhibition at the um, museum in Birmingham, uh, UK, where all of the objects come from. This uh, is the best collection in the world of Victorian art and design. Uh, Martin was for nearly 30 years the curator of the decorative arts collection. He's now an independent scholar. And I taught at the University of Birmingham right there for two years before moving to Yale. So my first experience as a teacher was bringing my students to sit on the floor in little groups looking at these paintings, the very paintings you have now in your gallery. So it's a very, very happy uh, re reuniting of, of uh, my interests with my earliest experiences. And um, the thought of being able to bring these things and share them with American audiences has been just uh, delightful. Now, um, this is how we hung the opening of the gallery um, at, at uh, Yale, and I'm dying to see some shots of your installation, which I know will be very, very beautiful as well. Um, but what we did want to do uh, in this, in this uh, initial sort of um, uh, view of the exhibition was to introduce Birmingham itself, because there is a reason for the kind of argument that we want to advance in this show. The show is an argument about industry. And it's not just a celebration of industry, although Birmingham is one of the great industrial cities of the world. It was, uh, if you like, it was Chicago before Chicago. It was the great metalworking city of the 1820s, 30s, 40s, 50s of the Victorian moment. It was the place where, for the first time in the history of the world, you could actually see mechanization, you could see factories, you could see smoke, uh, you could see huge amounts of money being made and lost, you could see terrible suffering and inequality. All of the problems that we see in the world outside now, in a way started in Birmingham, or at least started in, in Britain, the first industrial nation. It was in Britain where <clears throat> the industrial revolution really first began. Um, you might say first in, first out, because it also collapsed there um, in my childhood in the 1980s that we, uh, Britain became in a way the first post-industrial nation rather tragically. Um, but in those moments of the 19th century, it just looked as if Birmingham was a kind of mixture of heaven and hell. It had this glowing red furnaces all over it. There was the, the air was almost unbreathable with particles of carbon. On the other hand, this was the place where dreams were made, fortunes were made, where um, where objects were produced in a quantity and of a quality uh, and of a precision that had never been known before. Birmingham was really famous for its metalwork, for its metalworking trades. Artists, to get a view of Birmingham, had to step away from the city. There were no grand squares, particularly, no, no big vistas. It was all workshops. So you had to go out to the parkland around the city to get this distant prospect. Um, and in fact, I wanted to raise the issue of the Industrial Revolution and the Anthropocene, um, as it's now called. Um, uh, but of course, nobody in the 19th century realized that that was, uh, that that was what they were living through. And I want to just take you back to a little bit further to this picture, which is made in 1801. I was re recently reading a very scholarly account, which said that 1800 was the year at which it became impossible for what mankind had done to be reversed. It was the year when the carbon in the atmosphere, the changes in the environment had already reached a point of no return. And so um, this is painted in 1801. I like to call this work the first painting of the Anthropocene, the first painting of the industrial era. It's actually by an artist called De Luthorburg, Colebrookdale by night. Colebrookdale not too far from Birmingham is one of the great iron founding sites. And if you go close, I think de Lutherberg intuited, looking at the Industrial Revolution, that this was a letting loose power of awesome magnitude, but also danger. That you know the world will be changed and reshaped by industry, but also the world could be destroyed by it. I think that's a story which runs through our exhibition, but we'll see that it's responded to in various ways by our Victorians, uh, our Victorian radicals. Now, one of the objects I love most in this show, and I will say it's it's a really delightful show for me because it includes material objects, as you if you've seen it, you'll know three dimensional things, products, uh, material culture, we might call it, decorative arts, things which you could have in your house, as well as some of the great paintings of the 19th century. Normally these uh, shows are in separate museums. So um, in London, if you visited London, you'll know that the paintings are at the Tate Gallery or Tate Britain and the um, material um, objects are at the Victoria and Albert Museum. 
In Birmingham, they're both in the same, under the same roof, and that made it possible for us to tell a much more complicated story about how art and design responded to the changing world of the 19th century. And one of my favorite objects was made in Birmingham, uh, and that is a clock uh, made in 1851 by a clockmaker called Evans. And this uh, seems to catch something of the flavor of our exhibition, because if you look at the front, it's a sort of decorative Gothic structure. I hope you can see my little pointer. I think you can. Um, and it looks um, you know, almost as if it's looking back to the Middle Ages, to a medieval cathedral or something. Um, it's certainly highly decorative um, and doesn't look at all modern. Go around the back and you suddenly see that we're looking at modern machinery. We're looking at a timepiece, at a clock, which is precision engineered in those Birmingham forges. Um, let's get closer. And there it is. That's the 19th century for you. This is the century that invented the railway train, the telegraph, um, the photography, moving pictures, um, and all kinds of mechanical apparatus. So um, I just love the clock um, combining all those things. Now, this um, is not the most beautiful object in the exhibition, but it's in a way one of the most significant. And actually, when we installed the show at Yale, I um, persuaded my colleagues to bring this thing right to the front. So the first thing you see is this scary pink carpet with massive, massive pink and blue flowers on it. It's fantastic. I have to say, when we unrolled it for the first time to look at it, we could still smell the smell of the dyes. It had not, I think, been unrolled since, um, well, more than once anyway, uh, since the Great Exhibition of 1851, when it was first shown. And it was shown as a masterpiece of machine manufacturing. This, uh, this carpet was made um, by a company called Crossley in a place called Halifax, which is not 10 miles from where I was born and grew up in the north of England um, in Yorkshire. This, the heart of the textile part of the Industrial Revolution, Birmingham was all about metalwork. Now, the proud boast of the Victorians is that you could make hundreds of these things. You could make thousands of them, identical. You could sell them all over the world and each one would be the same. And um, in almost no human hand had been involved in its weaving because it was woven on a, a power loom. The, um, uh, the wool was spun on uh, through, through mechanized processes. The dyes are made from chemicals, not from natural products. This was a, a, ma a masterpiece. It's a kind of, you know, an Ikea, a Walmart object. You can buy them everywhere. Um, whether it's the most beautiful thing in the world is another matter. But certainly it was, um, you know, it was a new kind of production. And the people who made these made a fortune. Crossley's Mills, very, very uh, successful um, business venture. Um, get close to it. You know, this is a it's, a, it's an amazing technical accomplishment. Is it an amazing aesthetic accomplishment? Well, I um, uh, sort of condensed the entire argument of the exhibition by putting this object next to it. You'll see this, I think, in your show at the, at the end, which is where it appears in the catalogue. And this is a very, very beautiful bed cover, handmade by Mary Jane Newell, a, um, a, a teacher at the Birmingham School of Art, um, a, a woman um, uh, practitioner of textile design, um, made in 1908. Now the, the um, carpet we just looked at was made in 1851. So um, this is a unique object. It's a handmade object. It's dyed, um, uh, the, the linen is hand, hand woven and then dyed into, uh, we're using, anal using um, organic uh, dyes made from vegetables. Around the edge, Mary Jane Newell has um, individually embroidered every letter of a poem, beautiful poem by John Keats, the rainbow comes and goes and lovely is the rose. When you get closer to it, you can see all kinds of marvelous details like the owl who appears in the poem, um, the moon appears in the poem, beautifully woven into this unique object. I was standing uh, with these two objects with my students, my Yale, wonderful Yale students, in those three weeks when the show was open and it was quiet. And, and one of the students who didn't say much normally just said, this thing is spiritual. This object is spiritual. And I, it, it sent a shiver down my spine because she had absolutely identified the fact that the industrial thing um, versus the handmade thing have totally different qualities. This is um, big, brash, powerful, successful, expensive, money-making. This is artistic, handmade, 
does no damage to the environment, is made from um, vegetable stuffs that you could find in the United Kingdom mainly, not indigo, but the others. Um, so by putting those two things together, we kind of reverse the history that the 19th century told about itself. The 19th century said, you know, everything before us, the Victorians, was handmade, primitive, crude, you know, uh, old fashioned, clumsy. And now we make things which are brash and machine made and identical and hygienic and, uh, you know, powerful money making. And what Mary Jane Newell and my student intuited this did was to turn that history on its head and say, no, actually, the industrial object is what's going to be the death of us all. And think when you think about Crossley's factory in Halifax of the tiny children whose little fingers were used to go into the machines when the um, when the little um, threads got tangled, they had to put their tiny fingers in to pull the threads clean. And sometimes they would start the machine up to save money before the fingers were out. And you can imagine there is metaphorically, fortunately, not literally blood on this industrial carpet. So we're telling a story which is a story of progress, but it's not a story of industrial progress. It's a story of perhaps political progress in this exhibition. Now, uh, let's move on. So those are the kinds of factory settings in which these identical objects would be made. Steam power, think about that, burning coal to make, um, to boil water, to send pistons moving, and then these leather, um, amazing drive belts making these um, uh, machines spin and weave at great, huge speed, with the laborer has no skill at all, unlike our friend Mary Jane Newell, no skill, just uh, working, you know, to the clock. I mentioned the Great Exhibition, which is where that um, wonderful uh, slash horrible carpet was uh, was shown. This was a, 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 an extraordinary thing. The enormous building that was created in Hyde Park in London, 1,851 feet long for 1851, the year it was uh, made, um, and it was an it was an exhibition of things made all over the world. And the idea was every country brings its stuff to London to compare to things made in Britain. Now, what did those things look like? Well, they looked like the stuff that you see at the beginning of our exhibition, this amazing crystal um, or actually cut glass object on the right, or the reproduction statue that you see on the left, which was reproduced industrially so that anyone could buy one in the gift shop and take one home. There were th hundreds of thousands of, of these such um, Parian ware statues made in the 19th century. But I want to think most about this um, fruit bowl, at least that's what we'll start calling it, this fantastic object on the right, because this is an industrially produced object. Now, of course, it's not made by a machine. It's made by an incredibly skilled craftsman, but a machine is needed in order to cut so deeply into glass. You have to have a saw which moves at industrial speed, um, and which allows you to amazingly to hand hold this thing, move it into the saw so that the saw can cut through the glass without smashing it. So you have to have a steam powered saw and of course, terrible bits of glass flying everywhere in your eyes and so on. But it sparkles. It sparkles as if it was rock crystal, as if it was some precious object. Now, uh, this is a, such a great Victorian object because we, we showed it like this um, at Yale, and this is how it probably is shown uh, where you are. But um, in fact, if you, um, if you look at the original description of it, it's described as a fruit bowl, a pern, or a, um, um, a, 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 a rhubarb dispensing um, uh, bowl, um, or it could be used for celery. Now I thought, how the heck do you put celery in this thing? Well, this is, these are the Victorians, very, very uh, um, practically minded. You turn it upside down and then you can stick celery in the other side. Now, uh, when the exhibition was shown in Seattle, which is uh, near the, as you know, um, the, 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 there's a certain danger of, of earthquakes, um, we decided to install it the other way up, so it's much less likely to fall over. Um, and you can have it in Seattle, it's a, it's a celery bowl. In New Haven, it's a fruit bowl. It's a fantastic object, vulgar, brilliant. Um, even in the 1850s, even at the Great Exhibition, some designers were saying enough enough bling, enough of this extreme industrialization, this, this everything shiny, everything has brass knobs on it. On the left, we have a very simplified design, which is a beautiful beaker in the exhibition in which natural forms are being used in a very, very refined and sensitive way. But on the right, 
we have an object which is a key to the main argument of our exhibition by a Victorian radical, I would say. The artist here is Augustus Pugin, um, and he basically said industrialization has got it wrong, that everything in the modern age is ugly, that everything in the medieval era was beautiful, and that was because it was simple and religious and everyone cared about one another, and you know, essentially things have gone to hell, and that Birmingham is a kind of hell. Um, now, what did Pugin design? Well, <laughs> he designed the Palace of Westminster, which is uh, at least he decorated Big Ben um, in the Gothic style. So this is a sort of um, use of the Gothic for national purposes. But what I'm interested in uh, for the, uh, this lecture and for our exhibition is a book he published called Contrasts, because this lays out the changes since 1440 medieval era Here's a town in 1440 with the churches and the village green. And here's the same town, it might be Birmingham, in 1840, so, you know, the Victorian period. And look what's happened. The village green has a prison built on it. The churches are abandoned, neglected, at least the beautiful Gothic ones. And instead, there's workshops and factories and tenement buildings. There's a gas works here. And um, even in the foreground, the little beautiful little parish church has been replaced by a Methodist chapel. Pugin was a Catholic and he did not appreciate that. So he's telling us things are going backwards. How can we return to, how can we return to the world where things were beautiful? Well, we can start using medieval style for our stained glass windows in church. Almost every church in America that you go to that has a Gothic window, thank you Pugin. He was the person who revived the art of stained glass making. This was a moment of revolution too. This moment of political revolution because um, the industrial revolution worked very well for a small uh, group of people, the, the owners of the factories, and not so well for a much larger group, the uh, workers. And there was a demand not only for fair uh, distribution of the wealth of the country, but also for the vote. The vote which was denied to the majority of the population because they didn't own property. This. A revolutionary gathering took place in 1848. And you can see the poster. This is the Chartists. They're called the Chartists because they had a, a document, a charter, demanding what they say here, a fair day's wages for a fair day's work. Well, we're still waiting for that. Um, but they also say we are the slaves of capital. It's interesting because uh, Britain had already abolished slavery in its empire in 1838. Um, of course, there was still slavery in the United States. This is 1848. And the working men of London are saying that they are suffering like the enslaved in Jamaica and uh, other colonies. Um, now, in this crowd were a group of young artists, and that is who I'm going to turn to next. Not because they really were chartists, just because they wanted to see what was going on, this, this revolution um, uh, in front of them. Incidentally, what did happen in 1848 was um, France had a revolution, Germany had a revolution, um, all over Europe there were revolutions, in England, it rained, everyone went home, had a cup of tea, there was no revolution, we're still waiting for one. Um, okay, now those young artists who were at that, uh, at, that, at that amazing Chartist demonstration went back to the Royal Academy schools where they were being taught the most conservative kind of art making in the world. Beautiful, um, accomplished artists like William Etty who painted this great work that's in the show. But I mean, honestly, this could have been painted in I don't know, 1720, 1620, 1580. There's nothing new about it. There's nothing Victorian. He's, it's a mythological painting. Um, it quotes from Rubens. It's all about a kind of classical beauty. And to the, you're coming back from a, a revolution. You don't want to paint like this. Um, and other uh, British artists of this period were creating nostalgic landscapes, which took us back to what it used to be like before the Industrial Revolution. It's a beautiful painting by David Cox who lived in Birmingham. Um, and this is what he remembered from his childhood of the little village Harborn that, where he grew up. That's also where I had my little apartment when I was um, in, um, at the University of Birmingham. I can tell you Harborn does not look like this anymore. Harborn has a railway station, it has factories, it has a canal. In other words, this is nostalgia for a lost world. And this is what the boys, uh, these, these art students I'm talking about, were forced to do, copy classical sculpture. They did it brilliantly. This is John Everett Millet as a 16-year-old. As a 
But they all got together, this group of young uh, art students in Millet's house. You can still see it there in London. There's a plaque on the wall. And they just decided that this is all wrong, that art should uh, reference the world outside. Now, they, were spe they spent their time copying particularly the work of the artist Raphael. They were told this is the best artist in the history of art. This is your model. Spend five years copying Raphael, and then we might let you do something on your own. The gallery uh, in London, the National Gallery, was actually in the same building as the school, the Royal Academy Art School. So they could see this at painting every day, or paintings like this every day. And the curator of that uh, school started buying old Italian paintings to show just how primitive, that's the word they used, of course, comes from colonial anthropology, how primitive the paintings of the earlier period before Raphael were. And you can imagine what the students did. They did what all my students do, which is to take whatever I say and say the opposite, right? Because <laughs> that's in the nature of, you know, student development. So they decided to take the pictures that their tutors said were, pri were primitive instead of the perfect Raphael and to become pre-Raphaelites. Let's just see how they did that. So here is a painting by the same Millet who just did that drawing of the, um, of the classical sculpture. And look at the way that he's compressed the picture space. He's using gold. He's using blocks of color. He's taken those from paintings by Lorenzo Monaco. And you can actually see this is a, a quattrocento for uh, early 15th century um, or late 14th century painting by um, a, a very distinctive artist collected in London. Look at those faces uh, and the blocks of color. Um, Millet is learning deliberately not to paint sophisticated, high uh, Raphaelesque art, but to paint something true, true love of young, uh, young people. This is a story about the, the uh, um, Lorenzo and Isabella. Isabella falls in love with Lorenzo and it all ends really, really badly. But if you're a 19 year old art student, that's the kind of story you're interested in. They also saw a really bad painting, according to the National Gallery, which had been brought because it was all wrong. The perspective is wrong, crummy art. It was brought to show how bad art was in the 15th century before Raphael. This is Jan van Eyck's Arnolfini wedding. And I think you can imagine how that impacted these young artists, painting crisp and precise pictures of what the world really looks at, as if looking in a mirror. They started drawing in this amazing style, which is really quite unlike anything that they've been taught to do. It's almost as if they're relearning the whole history of art from the medieval onwards. And then they started painting the real world. This is an artist called Arthur Hughes, who was one of these pre-Raphaelites, although he wasn't actually a member of the original club. And how do you paint the world in the same way? Let's just go back and look at the way that Jan van Eyck painted the world in 1434. Um, in this famous picture, the Arnolfini wedding uh, portrait. He paints the world in exact detail, every inch, hair by hair. And uh, so does Arthur Hughes. Of course, he paints modern life. So he paints modern dresses made in these, you know, pretty lurid colors. And it was great that we were able to put one of the dresses in the room. I, I know you've, you've installed uh, one of the dresses in the room with the painting. So you can really look at these Victorian colors and look at the way that Hughes like Van Eyck, paints precisely what he sees. He paints a modern scene. And this is called The Long Engagement. It's a great Victorian story. The, uh, the, the man of the cloth, he's a sort of assistant vicar, um, a, a, a curate, has um, proposed marriage to a nice middle-class girl. Um, we'll discover her name in a minute. Um, she, her father won't let her marry him until um, he's got a promotion to a much more well-paid uh, job in the church. And this is taking him some time. So uh, here he is. He's looking up to God for some assistance in this matter. She's a little sad. Um, look at the detail with which this pre-Raphaelite, this um, Van Eyck-like detail in which the modern world is represented. Also the sentimental, if you like, or you could just say the emotional quality of these works. Um, even the dog is faithful, uh, but his name was Fido. And we even see the weave of the man's trousers. Now think of that um, factory in, uh, in Yorkshire making the cloth for this. This is machine woven, modern cloth. Amazing details, 
In the background, we've got all of nature. It kind of amuses me that the squirrels are allowed to get on with their sex life, but the human beings in Victorian England have to wait for many years. Um, look at the precision with which um, botany is represented, the different trees. I think that's an ash tree, the wild rose, um, the ivy, which climbs up the, um, uh, up the, the side of the, um, the, um, the, uh, the tree in the same way that uh, Amy will discover. Here she is, here's her name. Amy clings to her beloved, but he's carved her name in the tree and it's so long ago that the ivy has grown over it, right? Um, now, that's pre-Raphaelite modern life painting. The man who gave a kind of philosophical grandeur to this project was the critic John Ruskin. And John Ruskin really is one of the first critics of the Anthropocene. He saw, by looking really closely at nature in a kind of pre-Raphaelite way, the damage that was being done by industrialization. He saw the melting early on of the glaciers in the Alps. He noted the layer of soot which um, was, was um, deposited even hundreds of miles away from the nearest factory on, the, uh, on these, these um, Swiss um, uh, deposits of ice at the top of the Alps. He commissioned John Everett Millet to paint his portrait um, in Scotland, but he really wanted a portrait of the rocks, the history of geology, of the water, of the plant life of the area. It was a sort of scientific looking, um, made all the more intense by the fact that photography had just been invented. What can painting do that photography can't do? It can capture color at this time. It can capture movement. Um, now, Ruskin was one of the first people to really criticize the industrial world and to say it causes terrible damage to the environment. It causes terrible damage to society. It divides, and he said, you know, division of labor in the factory is not labor that's divided, it's human beings who are broken into bits. So this was a very important early critique of industrialization. Now, some pre-Raphaelite paintings are a bit more fun, and I did want to share this one with you. Do go and have a look at it if you can get into the exhibition. This is called The Pretty Bar Lambs. Um, and um, the reason I find it particularly delightful is it's, it's a study, obviously, of spring, spring sunshine, the artist's wife and, and uh, little baby daughter um, out in the, uh, in the sunshine. If you get closer, every blade of grass is represented meticulously. Ford Maddox Brown is the name of the artist, um, Pretty Bar Lambs. And what I want to share with you is this detail of the two sheep springing into the air. It's just that time of year now in, in England where the, the lambs are starting to bounce around, gambling in the fields. And he catches them in mid-flight. And this is long before the camera is able to do this, long before ca cameras had shutters at all. So these two um, sort of vertical takeoff sheep, I think, are absolutely charming natural details. This kind of detailed painting caused a revolution in the representation of history as well. This is the moment when historians are doing deep uh, research into um, documents and uh, archeologists are busy looking at uh, the, the, the record, the scientific record of, of, of lives lived. But what about the life of Christ himself? What if Christ isn't to be portrayed as Raphael or um, the um, traditions of the church insisted, but as a young boy, you know, born in the year zero, um, a, a young boy who goes, according to the Bible, into the temple, disputes with the Jewish doctors, with the, with the rabbis, um, and is suddenly found by Mary and Joseph, um, this amazing moment. What if we actually reconstructed precisely what that might have looked like using historical sources and ethnographic sources, you know, um, uh, in, in the case of this artist, William Holman Hunt, the painting's called The Finding of the Savior in the Temple. He actually um, you know, was unable to persuade uh, people in the Holy Land when he traveled there to sit for him. But when he came back to London, he went to a synagogue in the East End of London and asked two very, very ancient Jewish men to sit for him just to get the right type of face. Now, there's all sorts of problems we could start to find with this kind of painting, but the idea of it is truth. It's not actually true, <laughs> but the idea is to get to the scientific truth of the moment, the human moment when Mary re, you know, is reunited with her son, um, when uh, uh, the architecture of the, of the temple is, is reconstructed, not actually accurately, but Holman Hunt did, did the best he could. Um, and also the painting is filled with signs. The cross, of course, on Christ's belt is a prefiguration of the crucifixion. But look at the way that Holman Hunt paints every thread 
in this amazing uh, painting. The, the the bird could just be a you know passing dove, but of course it could also be a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Apply that same level of truth to what you see around you in England, and you will find some very shocking things. You'll find that uh, Victorian England is cruel. That terrible things happen, that men are sent out to break stones to make the road surfaces for the new roads. And in this case, um, it's too much for this man. How do we know that he's succumbed and died? This is the stone breaker by Henry Wallace. We know that. Um, here's almost like a crown of thorns, very powerful details um, and botanical details. But we know that because this little creature, a weasel, has climbed onto his foot a weasel would only do that if uh, it was, or it could be a stoat. You could only do that if uh, the body was cold. So we know that he's died and that he's a victim of the cruelty of this new capitalist Victorian system. And this painting, and I could spend hours on this, but I'm just going to very quickly introduce it to you because this is a self-portrait of Victorian England. I have to say my favorite work in the exhibition. You can spend hours with it. It's called Work by Ford Maddox Brown. <clears throat> it shows a street in London with uh, guys digging a hole in the road. Why would you even bother to paint that? Well, because the philosophers who are standing on one side will tell us that the only way that Britain got to be this great nation is by hard work. This is the Victorian gospel of labor. And here is the hero. The hero of this composition is not the, um, you know, the king or the Prime Minister, it's not certainly not Boris Johnson. It's um, it's a uh, really remarkable uh, image of the working man as hero, posed in the pose of a classical god, Apollo. Now, just uh, what, I, what I think is a wonderful uh, detail here, Ford Maddox Brown gives us the whole of the English class system in dog form. So we have people of all classes, but we also have dogs of all classes. It's part a bit of humor. Go and look at them when you're in the gallery. Working dog. This is a Jack Russell that goes down and kills um, rats in the hole. A mutt, an abandoned dog, someone we should take care of. A fancy dog, a silly dog, a bourgeois dog that doesn't do any make any use for itself, belongs to this lady. And finally at the back, the hunting dog, the aristocracy. So there you are, the entire English class system in canine form. There's a bit of fun there in the exhibition, but there's a serious point to this painting. And this figure at the left gives us that point, which is this is a man who's so poor, barefoot, um, that he's been completely forgotten by society. And if any of you know your English flowers, you'll know that these are forget-me-nots. So forget me not. Otherwise, there will be a revolution. Um, a wonderful image. There's the forget-me-nots. Um, I did, when we had this in an exhibition in 2012, managed to get this onto the national news. And I was so hoping that um, the prime minister at the time, David Cameron, might watch our three minute section on the six o'clock news about this painting and completely change his politics, but didn't work. Never mind. Um, I'm gonna move on now. The last move in our exhibition really shows how um, the, the, the artists, the Victorian radicals, turned away from this sort of very direct politics and direct painting to a much more poetic form of relationship with the past. But that in itself actually then made its way back into design and manufacturing. And that's where we end the exhibition. So Dante Gabriel Rossetti, who was one of the pre-Raphaelite painters, turned away from all that harshness of real life into a kind of fantasy world. And you can see here his amazing picture of St. George and Princess Sabra, St. George who killed the dragon. There it is. Um, and this also introduces another major theme in our exhibition, which we couldn't really bring in in the first couple of rooms, which is uh, the pioneering work of women artists. On the left is a work by Elizabeth Siddle called Lady Clare. It's a, it's a complicated story and I'll just uh, I'll leave it there, but just to say that I want you to compare the style of Elizabeth Siddle, who's obviously influenced by Rossetti, with Rossetti himself. Siddle was originally a model of Rossetti's, always wanted to be an artist, gradually learned to be an artist and then created works that I think are even more powerful than those of Dante Rossetti. This is very detailed and flamboyant and, and sort of spectacular, but look at the power of that S curve. I am going out into the world, says the girl, the, the, uh, the nun says, no, no, come and save your soul with us. What a powerful um, piece of design 
um, also about a woman making choices in her own life, which is a very important theme for Victorian women. Here is another later work by Rossetti, which establishes that pre-Raphaelite type that you're all, I'm sure, familiar with because it's it's everywhere, all over the internet. Very interesting. This is very popular with you know young people today, um, especially actually when we did an exhibition in Russia. They love this stuff. Six hundred thousand people came to see it, um, including supermodels. The whole thing. What's interesting here is that there's a very particular kind of beauty, a very particular image of a kind of poetic beauty. This is the model here is Jane, uh, a woman called Jane Burden who married William Morris. We'll come to him in a second. So she's Jane Morris. And here is Rossetti's picture of her. But for me, the showstopper in this part of the show is not the female imagery. It's this. This is a work by Simeon Solomon, um, uh, an artist who is remarkable for being um, what we would now call an out gay artist. He was uh, homosexual and made no secret of it in Victorian London. He took the female type of um, Rossetti and transformed uh, in basically a male figure into a kind, what one might call um, a kind of trans image of the, uh, the god Bacchus. This is still a challenging picture for us today. I tried to get the Yale Center for British Art to use this as our poster image just a bit too edgy, too edgy for them. But um, it's an image which bends gender. It's all about beauty. It's all about beauty, but beauty which is not coded distinctly masculine or feminine. These are radical, radical Victorian images. And now um, the two guys who dominate the end of our exhibition. Um, on the left, Edward Byrne Jones, um, painter, but also a designer on the right, William Morris, um, nicknamed Topsy. He was an incredibly energetic figure. When he died, um, uh, his doctor said he just died of being William Morris and doing more than any 10 men in normal lives. He was a designer essentially, but he was also a poet. He was a socialist campaigner. Um, he wrote novels. Um, he designed um, the smallest and the largest objects. Let's see why these guys are so important. Well, first of all, they went up to Oxford to become priests, but then they realized they didn't really believe in religion. Um, so they moved to London like many people from uh, universities. Everyone from Yale moves to New York. Everyone from Oxford and Cambridge moved to London. They got this apartment and they filled it with medieval junk, really. Luckily for Morris, he was wealthy enough to then turn this vision into an entire uh, building. So he built his own home, the Red House. You can visit it now in London, 1860, and created an interior inside it, which um, and then married Jane uh, and, and uh, they lived there together. An interior which reimagined what the medieval might be like. Nothing machine made in this house, nothing from the Crystal Palace, none of those, you know, um, um, cut glass objects uh, that we have in our exhibition. This is handmade, new Victorian medieval, they have frescoes on the wall, they have handmade furniture based on medieval examples. Some of the objects were so traditional, so sort of ancient in style, they were actually the most modern thing you could imagine. They just missed out the whole decorative Victorian excess. So these are the glasses that were made for William Morris's table for that house, the Red House, by his friend Philip Webb. They're in the exhibition. Go and see them. I think you would imagine they could be from 1920. Um, I was just talking to Christian about this before. We, you know, they would fit in anyone's mid-century modern house. These are exquisite, pure designs. 1860 Victorian radicals. Rossetti was the designer who took Pugin's idea of stained glass and turned it into a new art form, something quite dramatic, um, uh, secular and uh, religious. And um, gradually, William Morris started bringing his friends together to pioneer a new way of making things. This overturns everything we've seen in the exhibition so far. All of that machine-made um, stuff, all of the material from the Great Exhibition, was multiple, was made by um, no individual person. It was made by machines, by the division of labor, by cruel conditions. Morris said, if a thing is not made with the whole heart of the worker who designs it and makes it, it is an ugly object. The beauty lies in an, a thing being made by one person from scratch. Um, and these tiles are an example of objects made by Morris and company. He actually formed a, a kind of, anti-corporation to make textiles using hand 
technology and organic dyes based on, and this is my favorite one, the, the beautiful strawberry thief uh, textile, based on things he saw in his own garden. And um, when I visited Kelmscott House where Morris lived a couple of summers ago in the middle of summer, um, there was a patch of strawberries out here and I actually saw a thrush, this bird that you can see so clearly here, land down there, eat a strawberry and fly away. And it, I have to say that was one of those moments where you just feel William Morris sitting in the room with you because he says only natural forms, natural dyes, handwork will make these beautiful objects. Of course, the trouble was they were terribly expensive and he never resolved that paradox. Um, he made, however, the most gorgeous textiles. You'll see them in the show. Wallpapers, printed wallpapers, hand printed with wooden blocks, not on rollers in a steam press in, in which little fingers get chopped off. His friend, William de Morgan, applied the same um, uh, sort of idea to uh, making ceramics, this beautiful uh, object on the right in the show influenced by Islamic uh, um, uh, ceramic design, but very distinctly of the Victorian era. And Morris gradually became more and more radical. He ultimately believed that the industrial world had to be overturned, that there had to be an actual revolution. Of course, there hasn't been. But he wrote an extraordinary novel, which I really recommend you. This is your reading uh, list to take away from the show a novel called News From Nowhere, where he goes to sleep one night in Victorian London with all the smoke and the railway and the gas works and, the, and he wakes up and it's beautiful again. It looks like this. It's clean and tidy. And he goes outside and he and gathers from someone that it's the year 2103 and that there's been a revolution and the Anthropocene has been reversed and the sky is clear and the pollution is gone and he's woken up in a perfect medieval world, a kind of pre-Raphaelite, post-industrial world. It's an amazing novel written in 1890. Um, let's look at some of the artists who are very briefly, some of the artists who were influenced by him, because a whole generation of artists, many of them women, were influenced by Morris and company, by the textiles, by the metalwork, and also by the pre-Raphaelites, by looking closely at nature, as Ruskin, John Ruskin had said. Um, this is uh, Kate Bunce's wonderful uh, picture, Musica, in which she um, demonstrates the art of music, but also many other arts, the art of uh, textile manufacturing, the arts of metalwork. And, and Kate Bunce actually taught in Birmingham at the Birmingham Schools of Art. And you can see that metalwork here, this beautiful jewellery, is what um, Birmingham's um, Victorian radicals chose as their own um, particular preferred medium. So at the end of the show, we have some amazing objects. This is um, <clears throat> textile made by William Morris's daughter, May Morris, with these exquisite little, it's a child's, um, a child's smock with these exquisite little pieces of um, embroidery on it. But this is what I wanted to share with you. Um, the jewelry that comes at the end of the exhibition is not bling. It's not that kind of, um, you know, Fabergé sort of highly valuable um, uh, gems. It's, it's semi-precious stones, or in this case, it's enamel, but it's handmade and it's personal. Um, and it almost looks as if it comes from the medieval world. To get close to this, you can see how personal. This is um, a wonderful a necklace made in 1893 by an artist called George Frampton, who's also a sculptor. You can just make out C-H-R-I-S, Christabel. This was the uh, necklace that he gave to his wife, Christabel Frampton, who was also a designer. There are many um, ma man and woman couples of, of designers towards the end of our exhibition. There it is, look, you can see Christabel, 1893. Well, that is the engagement present that anyone would want. Um, and suddenly we start seeing handmade metal objects, not banged out on, on a machine or by a, a bunch of uh, laborers in a division of labor, handmade by members of what became known as the arts and crafts movement, which sprung out of William Morris. Here we've got um, a fantastic um, <clears throat> uh, cigar box here, cigarette box by uh, an artist called Anne Grisdale Stubbs, women designing metalwork. Imagine what Queen Victoria would have thought of that. Well, these are Victorian radicals. And finally, we come back to where I started, to this gorgeous, handmade object. And I, can, I hope you can see now how this object is the end of a long process of criticism 
and of change, which began with the idea that something was going terribly wrong when carpets are made at the cost of little fingers, when carpets are made at the cost of the environment, when they're big and vulgar. Um, and the idea that going back to something meaningful something which is, can be made without cost or, or violence um, is actually a really radical proposition. I often think when I'm going around Walmart, um, and of course I do go there because William Morris never figured out the whole <laughs> issue of things being too expensive to be make, made by hand. But if I'm am among you know, a pile of brightly colored plastic objects made probably by some, uh, somebody in a factory in China who had a terrible, terrible environmental conditions, I think of this object, you know, and I think maybe they had it right. Maybe the Victorian radicals understood the kind of whirlwind that we were going to reap at the end of the 21st century. So although this is an exhibition with many delights, and I hope you enjoy every one of them, it is also an exhibition with quite a serious point. Thank you so much for your attention. I'd love to try and answer some of your comments or questions, and please disagree with me. That's what it's all for. Dr. Wager, thank you so much. That was uh, that was truly amazing. Um, and please use the the chat feature or the Q and A feature to queue up any questions that you might have. We did have one question that came in during the talk from Kathleen, mm -hmm. which is um, I think it's a really interesting question. Thinking about mm -hmm. the global um, perspective at the time, um, Kathleen's question is that she's wondering how in specifically thinking and connecting to the French impression is how they had materials that were newly available to them, such as the paint tube and whatnot that allowed them to paint in new ways. How did the advancements, uh, if there were advancements in materials at the time, um, change the way that these artists were able to create this revolutionary way of painting and shift their thinking about the works that they were creating? And in a, a, a secondary similar question, I guess, is. Mm. Um, how would how were artists in the rest of the world uh, and the connection between artists in France in particular responding to this work and to these shifts in, in thinking? Yes, that's a great point. I mean, um, we've been taught to imagine that <clears throat> uh, French Impressionism is is modern art. That's what you know the, the textbook will tell you. <clears throat> and often you'll get a comparison with one of these paintings to say that um, you know the, the, these guys got it wrong. Right, that the, the British were somehow backwards or too literary or sentimental or whatever. And, you know, you can make that argument. I think that argument was more convincing when um, modern contemporary art was things like Jackson Pollock and painting. So you can see a line from, you know, Corbet to Manet to Monet to Gauguin to Pollock, whatever, Picasso. And now that's that's dead. I mean, that kind of painting is, <clears throat> is over. And so um, there's, there are many different kinds of modern and contemporary art, many of which are interested in questions of ecology and the body and uh, things that Impressionist painting didn't deal with. Um, so, you know, I think we can now look back to the 19th century and say, well, actually, many things are happening in that century. France was a much less developed economy uh, than Britain in the 19th century, much, much less industrialized. Um, and I think the Impressionists, frankly, were rather backward in the fact that they didn't, they didn't, uh, Pizarro did, but the, but the rest of them were interested in what the world looked like, but they weren't so interested actually in the analysis of the social implications of what they were looking at. They was, it was a kind of landscape of visual pleasure, which is delightful. That's why we want to have them over the couch but it doesn't come with an analysis of what's happening. So, um, in, for example, in those images of, of railways crossing the Seine by Monet, then you can see that the water is this strange color. Well, it turns out that's dye from the local factory. I don't think Monet was that bothered necessarily about those sorts of changes. So the ecological critique comes from the people who've suffered it most the longest. Um, and Birmingham is a hell of a lot more of a mess than Paris was. So that I think is one, is one way of thinking about it. Now, in terms of specifically of, of paint uh, availability, um, the Impressionists and, the, and uh, bought a lot of their um, paints from a, a firm called Roberson, which was based in, in London. So, and they made aniline dyes, they made chemicals. So the Brits were quite good with chemicals or the Germans were even better. So your really best chemicals come from Germany. Um, in the 19th century. Um, these very, very complicated um, uh, chemical uh, processes in the Ruhr Valley and so on. So everyone wanted the brightest colors that they could get. Um, it was William Morris who blew the whistle on that. Because if you use those colors 
you end up with carpets like the one we started out mm -hmm. with. And if you want a really beautiful color, a subtle color, the, the, remember the strawberry thief, the colors in that? Those are made by William Morris getting local plants and making big vats of dye. Um, apparently his arms were purple up to his, up to his shoulders because he spent his time sort of making this dye, organic dye, not uh, paint in a tube, not poisonous and not polluting. So in a funny way, um, you know, what's so difficult for us to understand about the, the Victorians is they understood that the medieval is more modern than, than the now that there's something sustainable about, say, um, you know, handmade things, indigenous cultures, you know, that we now are starting to understand that the people who looked after this land that we live in for, you know, 35,000 years did a good job. And we took 400 to really mess it up and set it on fire. So, you know, that, that idea that industrialization is actually not progress is what the Victorian radicals had to tell us. But I think one one quick note there that I think is really fascinating for me and listening to uh, to your answer, which was wonderful, thank you, is that we find ourselves in the midst of a technological revolution at, the, yeah. at this moment. And we see this return to um, looking back to indigenous cultures for inspiration yeah. and for guidance and how to take care of the planet. And you see this, this rise in return to craft and a lot of natural dyes and natural plants and homeopathy and things of that nature. Um, it's, it's like we've kind of cycled back through. Uh, we're gonna try to get to as many of these questions as we can, but I do wanna ask, Anne, do you have any questions for Dr. Berenger this evening? Yeah, I do have one for you. Um, sure. I, I wanted to ask, uh, you know, many of the paintings in the exhibition obviously have religious themes. Mm. Is it possible <clears throat> to generalize about uh, sort of the religious disposition of the brotherhood mm -hmm. artists or uh, were they practicing a particular religion in response to sort of this increased secularization or how yeah. would you? Uh, That's a great point. Um, I think everyone in the 19th century struggled with, with how to match up the religion they grew up with, with the world that they saw around them. How can you, you know, how can you make it feel relevant? Um, and William Holman Hunt had a, an evangelical awakening. So he's the one of the, all the artists in the show who actually, you know, doubted he was, a, you know, as, as a teenager, he kind of lost his faith, but then he, he literally woke up one night with a, with a, with a new birth, a rebirth. And that's what set him on the road to actually going to, um, you know, to Jerusalem and to Nazareth uh, to actually paint the life of Christ in situ. He was really believed that, you know, if you, if you don't, if you get rid of the church and you go straight to the truth of the Bible, you can get to the heart of it. So he was a proper 19th century evangelical. He also in interestingly supported very strongly the founding of the state of Israel. So he was really mixed up in religious thinking. William Morris and Edward Byrne Jones, who went to Oxford to become priests, I mean, they were, you know, they were actually theology undergrads, completely dropped it. They, um, uh, they essentially transferred their religious feelings into feelings about beauty and social truth. So they ended up as sort of, you know, they still decorated churches, but they didn't really, they weren't really Christian in that sense. And of course, a lot of the artists were purely secular. The one who's the most powerful, if you want to read a, a Victorian mind trying to deal with this complicated question is, is John Ruskin, the great writer and critic. And he started off, he was brought up by his mother, learned the Bible, a, a significant chunks of it off by heart. That's why he wrote so beautifully, he had this language. But in his middle life, as he spent more time in the industrial world, his faith started to crumble. And he describes that with wrenching um, realism in his, in his text. So it's a, mixed, it's a mixture um, that, you know, that, Everyone was looking for those sorts of truths, but they didn't always find them in conventional religion. Thank you. Mm -hmm. so Great question, time thank you, Ed. Time for, for perhaps one more question. There is one question that I'm gonna answer by way of um, also um, pointing everybody towards the upcoming programs that we have. There's a question, several questions about notable women artists in, within the movement and of the time. And, uh, to answer that question, I'm going to say I think it would be fantastic for folks to join us on April 2nd. We've got author uh, Kristen Spinell Walker coming to talk about the pre raphaelite Girl Gang. Um, right. uh, she's got a book which features you know, over 50 movers, shakers, and thinkers of the time. 
Um, and that's on April 2nd. You can find more information on our website. And then um, on April 22nd, we've got um, curator Wendy Kaplan from uh, LACMA coming to join us with uh, uh, a talk titled Women in the Arts and Crafts Movement. So we're going to we're going to hold that for a little bit later in the exhibition. There's a number of notable women that are featured in the exhibition uh, that you can you can see. But I think I'd like to close this today, um, unfortunately due to time, with this question that Betsy asked us. Um, Dr. Berger, can you talk about what spurred the end of this movement, or rather the evolution, or how this, this movement evolved and moved past a period that we would think of as the, the height of the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood and this arts and crafts movement and what it moved into? That's a great question. Thank you, Betsy. Yes. Um, well, I think the answer is it never ended. Um, what's really fascinating is that the design element of it was more obviously picked up in the 20th century than the painting element of it. So um, uh, there's a wonderful book by um, a historian called Nicholas Pevsner called Pioneers of Modern Design. And you put, put it off the shelf, you think you're going to get, I don't know, Le Corbusier in Paris, and you're going to get, you know, Eames, and you're going to get those sorts of names. And the first chapter is on Pugin, and the second chapter is on William Morris. And, and Pevsner, who, who should know, because he was born and brought up in the Bauhaus in Germany, which is a, the ultimate kind of modernist design um, school, um, he actually saw that in order to have modern design, you have to have industry. And in order to, ha in order to have a kind of avant-garde design, you have to react against that industry. So the sort of simplification of design and the idea of form follows function which is the heart of modern design, is there in Pugin's book, Contrasts, which I shared with you in 1840. Look at William Morris's glassware in your exhibition, and you have some of the most, in the exhibition in your museum right now, you'll see some of the most incredibly simplified and um, sort of stylized modern design that you could, you could imagine. Um, and so that's the way that it moves into the, into the 20th century. Um, Frank Lloyd Wright, hugely influenced by William Morris, for example. So there's a, there's a line through, um, through those elements. And um, what's fascinating is that in the 1960s, um, rock bands and, um, you know, uh, sort of uh, hipster, you know, hip, hippies picked up pre-Raphaelite style. Um, in uh, you know when I when I was first aware of looking at magazines, it was Twiggy. Twiggy used to wear. She was the great British nineteen uh, sixties uh, model. She used to wear William Morris fabrics, and um, there was a sort of return to that. If you look at the Beatles albums, Sergeant Pepper, look at the cover, totally Victorian, completely pre raphaelite So there was a sort of revival in the in the sixties, and then in the nineteen seventies, everyone started doing exhibitions again of these supposedly forgotten artists. So Burne Jones, 1975. And then in, in the 80s, when, you know, the age of the shoulder pad and, and you know, suddenly the Victorians were back. Um, I was an undergraduate in 1984 and I went to an exhibition tape called The Pre-Raphaelites. And that was the end of my career in banking. You know, I, 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 from that point on, I knew I had to work on this stuff because they put it on the wall, but they didn't have anything to say about it yet. Everyone loved it. Everyone loved it in the 80s. And since then, you know, our, our show that we did in um, at the Tate and uh, went to Washington and Moscow, over a million people came, which is, you know, astonishing to me. But they love it. Um, I was so happy when these Russian supermodels with uh, you know, like things through their noses and on 12 inch heels were teetering around the exhibition, go, you know, pre-Raphaelites, they love it. So in a funny way, it's always been there. Um, but I think the design element was there through the whole 20th century and the painting aspect, particularly when people started painting bodies again, you know, in the eighties, David Hockney, really interested in the Pre-Raphaelites. I had a great conversation with him about this. Um, he paints these landscapes with these brilliant greens and yellows. Where does that come from? Well, yeah, Monet, but actually, you know, Pre-Raphaelites. So anyway, uh, I think, I hope that's an answer to your question. At least that explains why I'm excited about it, even if it doesn't explain the whole history of art. Thank you. Absolutely, I think it's um no when when you mentioned David Hockney, it made me also think about an artist such as like Alex Katz, for example. Yes. Just in some of the posing and color blocking that he's using, there's a, a very direct lineage that can be drawn back to the Pre-Raphaelites, and um, uh, yeah, that's a tremendous note to end on. Um, I'd like to thank you again very much, uh, Dr. Ranger, for spending this afternoon with us and 
bringing us, uh, ushering us into the world of the Victorian radicals um, it, it's been an absolute delight. And I know that our audience has been very happy to, to spend some time with you. Uh, I'd also like it's to- my pleasure. Thank you very much. Again, um, for joining us today. And um, I'd like to, again, thank all of our wonderful sponsors and donors who've made this exhibition possible to be able to bring these masterworks to uh, Northern Nevada and share them with our audiences which is a great point to remind everybody the museum is open, come and see the exhibition. Um, it's tremendous, visit it more than once. I think you'll, you'll need more than one visit to really be able to take this in. Um, and I would also encourage you to visit nevadaart.org to check out all the other upcoming programs that we have related to this exhibition uh, this month, next month, and into May before the exhibition closes, I believe at the end of May. Um, with that, thank you everybody for joining us, uh, spending the afternoon with us. Dr. Berenger, thank you so much again, and uh, we will see you next time. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, everybody.